My girlfriend says I'm being abusive. I need to give a little backstory. So when I was younger maybe around 13 to 15 my older brother had this amazing girlfriend who I really liked and considered a part of the family. They broke up and I shortly find out the reason why is because she had cheated on him years ago and she finally came clean about it after years of built up guilt. He became very depressed and said he felt like he wasted so much time on her. I went to the internet and did more research on infidelity, it is plaguing America, no matter how much trust and love you have with someone. In my opinion if you put full trust into someone and never recognize the possibility of infidelity and never put up some kind of safeguard against it, you are a fool who may be wasting years of their life or even your entire life with someone with a secret affair. Seriously go do research on infidelity and how common it is, so I've adopted a few safeguards, no close opposite sex friends whom you spend private one-on-one -on -one time with in person, no going to bars or clubs without me, anytime I get any type of gut feeling I ask to check your phone and declining my request or making me wait results in a breakup. It is important to note when I check a phone I only look at messages between my partner and an unknown person, looking at anything else would be a breach of privacy in my eyes, so far these safeguards actually saved me from wasting time on someone who cheated on me, without these safeguards it would have flown under my radar. I also uphold these rules on myself, I don't have friendships with any women, I don't go to bars without my GF despite being a person who likes going to bars, anytime my partner asks to check my phone I oblige without question. I also let my partners know about these safeguards early on in the relationship, my current girlfriend was actually happy about it and accepted them because I uphold the rules on myself and it makes her comfortable in the relationship. The problem arose when she met a guy while working, he told her he had just moved recently and was looking for new friends, they exchanged contacts and she told me about it. I was fine with it because I really don't care if my partner is simply in contact with guys in the area, then told me she was going to get coffee with this guy, I told her if she does then I'd break up with her and I promptly asked to check her messages with this guy. She was hesitant, but when I told her I was going to end things if I couldn't check immediately she let me, he was flirting with her by making comments on how beautiful she is and I told her to cut all contact with the guy, I was met with the you're being abusive and controlling, you're insecure but she cut contact with him anyway and told me I don't like these rules, I won't break up with you but please reconsider having them which I found ridiculous but I did research and supposedly the things I do are red flags and toxic. Are these things really so bad? I don't want my GF to feel like I am controlling her. My entire family wants me to forgive my mom for trying to unalive me. I went no contact with my mother at 17, because of two separate events. My dad and stepmom are the only two who agree, and even I think they probably only agree because my mom is a self-righteous jerk and was very conscientious of me and my stepmother's relationship growing up, that I can live with. My mother has never believed that my father didn't cheat on her when they were married. I don't believe he did, not because he's too good of a man, but because my stepmom didn't even live in this state before my parents' divorce, and my dad can barely work a flip phone. I am going to recount both events as fairly as I can, because I don't want to be accused of leaving something out about her. When I was 14 shortly after my parents' divorce was finalized, my mother had a terrible miscarriage. She had to be driven to a hospital in the middle of the night, and I cleaned up the mess that was quite literally everywhere. She became understandably insanely depressed. I tried to either be there for her, or let her grieve alone depending on what signals she was sending, but she was never interested. She asked me why didn't I just stay at my dad's house because I hate her so much. I went to stay with my dad's for a few weeks after that, because honestly, it hurt too much to be around her. When I came back to her place the first one happened. She insisted that I had been talking bad about her to my father in his toy and said I wasn't allowed to have a bedroom door because she didn't want me telling her secrets in there. She took my door and often would stick her head in my room and just look at me, ask me what I'm doing, or even take pictures of me, and glaring. Eventually I broke down and told my dad. He called her and she threatened not only to unalive herself but to unalive him and my stepmom. She was put into a facility for a while, and when she came out she was deeply apologetic, and I tried to forgive her, but the trust was gone, it was so hard to be near her, knowing the things she had done. Still I tried until I was about 16, and her parents died. It was tragic, she was absolutely wrecked and could barely get out of bed. Then one day I came home to her on the couch, where she held my previous phone. She demanded I open it, because I shouldn't be keeping things from her. I said no. She told me to sit on the couch, and she asked me again to open the phone. What she didn't know was that I am bisexual, and I was terrified of her seeing the messages between me and my first girlfriend. Then she walked to the kitchen and came back with scissors. She said if I didn't open the phone she would cut all my hair off. Then she grabbed a handful of my hair and cut it off as high as she could. She got so close, she accidentally cut my ear. I locked myself in the bathroom and called my dad and when he showed up my mom tried to attack him with the scissors. I don't know all the specifics except that I told a judge I would never speak to my mother again, and that if they put me back into her house I would refuse to go. The judge emphasized that my mother was genuinely sorry, and that after her parents died she had a breakdown, and that he's sure she would do anything to make it up to me. I told him I didn't care. After that I lived with my dad full time, and went to see my cousins and such over the summer, but I haven't seen or spoken to my mother since that day. She has sent me two letters, both owning up to the things she has done, and earnestly apologizing. I believe her when she says that she's better, and that she would never hurt me on purpose, but it doesn't matter. I hate her. Her baby dying wasn't my fault. Her parents dying wasn't my fault. Why was I the one punished? My cousins from my mom's side came to visit me yesterday and told me that my mother has cancer, and that she wants to see me, that I shouldn't let the darkest moments of my mother's life determine our entire relationship. 
but how could I ever trust her? How could I ever not hate her? My lesbian ex cheated on me and got pregnant and claims it's mine. Seven years ago I was married to my dear ex, we were together for six years at this point, I thought we had a great relationship, a year prior I received a nice inheritance, I used the money first to buy a condo for us to live, a new car for her because hers was falling apart as a thank you for her constant support over the years, and the rest went to starting my own company. I thought we loved each other, we had talked endless times about kids, we both wanted a family. One day when I came home from work, she was seated on the couch and signaled for me to sit with her, then she told me she was pregnant. I was happy for like half a millisecond, I always wanted kids, but when I realized about the impossibility of this happening because we were both cis women, I started to cry for what it meant. Then she started to cry and say sorry but that this could be a good thing now. Incredibly I asked how on earth could this be a good thing, she said that this could be the perfect opportunity for us to have the family we always wanted. I didn't have the energy to argue at that moment, so I packed some things and told her I was gonna be staying with my cousin for a few days and come back to talk. I was a complete disaster with my cousin for a week, then I returned, said I wanted a divorce, packed all the rest of my things while she tells me that she can't do it without me and that I'm abandoning our child, I said nothing, I couldn't speak, I didn't have it in me to do anything but pack and leave. In the divorce I let her have the condo, her car it was on my name, she demanded alimony, I gave it to her for a year even though she wasn't really entitled to it, she demanded child support but was denied for obvious reasons. A year later it was done, a month before the divorce was finalized, I met a woman, I wasn't sure about dating but my friends encouraged me to get back out there, so I did. It was slow, I told her about my past, she felt really bad for me. We went on dates, we kissed, then she stopped responding to my texts and calls for a week. I didn't know what was happening, she then showed up at my home looking sad. She tells me she's pregnant, to which I think not again. But she quickly explains that she found out a few days ago, she had an appointment that day and was told she was about 16 weeks along, that she did not cheat since we had known each other for 3 months, that she knows this might be somehow triggering for me, that she really likes me but understands if I want nothing to do with her and left. Ultimately I couldn't let her go, and we stayed together. The whole ordeal was a bit confusing at first but we worked it out. Now my company is on the rise and it's been for years, we bought a house, got married, had 2 more kids, a dog and a cat, her family loves me, my family loves her. But then last Saturday my ex had to appear again. We are in a family gathering on my wife's side. When she showed up to, wife's, aunt's house to expose me as a horrible person who abandoned her wife and child and left them with nothing to go start a new family with a disgusting girl and raise someone else's child, and that since I have money I have to start paying the overdue child support and blah blah blah. Apparently she befriended my wife's cousin's wife in PTA, told her about me, she gave my name and my wife's cousin's wife was shocked and appalled by my actions and decided they were going to confront me in the family gathering for everyone to hear and show them the evidence. Me and my wife were inside with one of her sisters getting snacks for the kids, when we heard a commotion outside and went to see what was happening and there she was halfway through her story showing the OI document stating I was part of the process, hence responsible for the child, but if it has my name on it it's fake, I didn't get to actually read it, I think that's why they believed her so quickly. My wife tried to argue back but was cut by her aunt cousin's mom, and in not a very nice way kicked us out with a promise to take my treatment of my ex public and ruin my company. Am I the jerk for cooking Chinese food instead of real Chinese food? I was born in China. But my parents and I moved to the West when I was little, so I was raised mostly Westerner but my parents still managed to teach me many Chinese traditions, including food, and I sometimes still cook what they cook. So, I've been with my boyfriend for about 3 years and he lives with me at my place. This Christmas, his family, mom, dad, sister and nephew, came to visit him from his birth country, Spain, for the first time in years. I was excited because I never had a chance to meet them in person. They arrived a few days before Christmas, he went to pick them up at the airport while I was working, so when I came home they were already there. The meeting didn't go as well as I would wish, because the little nephew as soon as he saw me started doing the eye stretching thing. He was immediately reprimanded by his mom and grandparents, but the following days he made a lot of racist jokes in Spanish like what do you call someone who doesn't take a shower, in Chinese? Shin Shan Poo, without shampoo, and he was barely reprimanded for that. Besides that, Christmas went great, and the next day we woke up very late. The nephew started saying that he wanted Chinese food for lunch, so my boyfriend's parents asked me if I could make it. I said sure, I was glad to do it. I cooked something my parents would do on a special occasion like these, and served the table in a very traditional way, with chopsticks and everything. Then I called everybody to the table, and instantly saw their disappointed faces. The nephew said what's this? To which I said Chinese food he grunted and said no is not and started to throw a fit. His mom calmed him down, then boyfriend's parents told me this isn't what we were expecting I asked what did you expect? And they replied you know, something like what they serve at restaurants. I tried to explain to them that this is something actual Chinese people eat, but wouldn't listen, they dressed up and went outside to eat at a restaurant. My boyfriend stayed at home, but then called me stupid, he said you knew exactly what they meant by Chinese food, I'm trying to make you look good in front of them, but you're not helping me by playing dumb. I asked him to explain himself better but just shouted when people say Chinese food the last thing they expect is white rice, get a effing clue and locked himself in our bedroom. After that incident, they started to speak to me as a toddler, over explaining everything they asked me to do, and stopped correcting the nephew's racist behavior. I tried to tell my boyfriend to tell them to stop, 
but he said this is your making, now they think you're brainless this continued till they left yesterday. My boyfriend and I now barely talk, and I wonder if it's really my fault and I should have known better. I talked to my family about it, they were furious at him and I had their support, especially my father. I'm so glad that they were by my side. I went to my place with my father to confront my boyfriend and break up once and for all. He didn't take it well, shouted that I can't break up with him and he won't end the relationship, that's where my dad intervened and they started fighting. My dad ended up being hurt but he also landed some hits on my boyfriend. I was horrified, crying, screaming and with no idea of what to do. My boyfriend then grabbed me, got my purse and took me out, my dad followed me. My keys and phone were in the purse so I couldn't go back in. He locked himself and we started hearing him breaking stuff. Then dad called the police. They arrived like half an hour later, during that entire time he did hear him breaking stuff. When the cops finally arrived, they tried to talk to him but wouldn't respond, so they broke the door and after another fight they arrested him. I walked in my place with another cop and my dad and everything was destroyed. Everything he could break was broken, from glasses to plates to mirrors to holes in the walls, every TV, my computer, my phone, coffee maker, etc. Dad pressed charges immediately. I was terrified, and I'm still terrified. We had a trial and he is in jail now, but I think he might be deported to Spain, I'm not sure. I'm still in therapy and still living with my parents. Some of my stuff was repaid but I'm still not ready to come back home. Sometimes I still wake up crying in the middle of the night. I don't know if I regret standing up for myself, or if I will be able to trust people in the future. I might die alone without a husband or children and that makes me sad. I had unalive thoughts but I find things that make me want to stay alive. I don't know when I will feel good for real, but progress has been made. Oh, and my ex-boyfriend's family are still trying to reach me to insult me and make me feel even worse for sending him to jail. I block them but always find yet another phone number to call me from or a temporary mail address. I, 38F, am in a new relationship, M51, and his texts are starting to concern me. My current boyfriend and I have been together since February and we've had a few arguments but generally things are good. What I can't wrap my head around are some of the text messages that he sends me. They come out of nowhere and feel a little nuts to me. I don't know if I'm the one being a jerk here but I don't know what to make of them. I've told him it puts me off but he doesn't seem to hear me. This is an example of one he sent today after he video called at lunch. I answered but he hung up and wouldn't answer when I called back. I left a message saying I guess he didn't have service and couldn't answer but just call back if it's important. His reply was what would be the point in answering after seeing your dressed makeup on and hair done? That tells me you have been up for hours and in that time I guarantee that her phone has been in her hand a lot and never once did you have the desire or want to call or text and say hello good morning I love you or even fuck off for that matter. And that makes me feel like shit to be really honest. So I didn't answer. Five minutes later I got this and because you still have nothing to say, that just tells me I was right. This kind of thing is getting more frequent. I feel like it's kind of excessive but he says it feels like I don't love him. I don't even know how to respond honestly. I packed a bag, my laptop, GN, important paperwork, etc. Most of my stuff is in storage because we were supposed to move at the end of the month. I didn't want to leave him there but his texts got really ugly when I told him it was over. I feel a lot safer at my friend's house out of town. The barrage of texts have gone from nasty to desperate to accusing me of lying and never caring about him to him taking photos of gifts he supposedly bought me to threatening to hurt himself and me. Apparently I'm not giving a shit about it but here I sit trying to fucking talk to you and work this fucking thing out because I care more about you than I do the lies. I love you D. Why can't that be enough for you? I'm so done with this bullshit. It's probably going to be hard trying to get him out of my life but I'm saving the texts and going to, at least try, get a protective order tomorrow. I think I kept adjusting to a new normal every time he would do something that was off but not quite bad enough to break up over. We had endless talks about his behavior and he was very good at reassuring me he'd work on it and then being the best boyfriend imaginable. It's like he's two different people but I'm positive the nice side is an absolute lie now after some of the stuff he said. I'm safe for now and definitely won't be going home without an escort. He moved in so quickly because we've been good friends for 5 years and he never once acted like this. I thought I knew him pretty well so that's why I gave him the benefit of the doubt for so long and let him move in. When he proposed it was so romantic and he was so convincing I got a little swept up in the idea that it was real. Am I the jerk for breaking my fiancé's family tradition by naming my son what I wanted? Myself, 25, and my fiancé, 27, have a 2-month-old son. We are overjoyed at being parents, but most of my in-laws are refusing to even see our baby because of a decision we made concerning his name. My in-laws have a tradition of giving the firstborn son of every generation the same name. Let's say it's Peter. This has been going on for about 7 generations already, and they're very serious about it. My fiancé's eldest cousin was the latest person to get named Peter. Every one of his cousins has only had daughters so far, so our baby is the first son of his generation, and consequently should get the name. I have no problem with the name Peter, and would have been okay with naming my son that. Unfortunately, that was also the name of my uncle, who died before I was born. I won't get into details, but it was tragic and traumatizing for my family. My father never got over losing his younger brother. My grandmother asked the family not to name any of our future children Peter during her lifetime. My mother-in-law and father-in-law knew about this promise, and at first seemed to not only be okay with us avoiding the name Peter, but also supportive of the one we chose. However, my grandmother sadly passed away when I was 7 months pregnant. 
We traveled for her funeral. On our last days there, my in-laws called to offer me their condolences. Then my mother-in-law asked me if I was willing to think about the name Peter now. Suddenly, they were insistent that the name we chose was awful and we had to honor their tradition. According to them, they had only agreed to make an exception for us for my grandmother's sake, and had no obligation to keep it now that she had passed. My family agrees that while it's true we don't have to avoid the name anymore, it still doesn't feel right to use it. My fiancé agrees with me as well, but his parents spent the last weeks of my pregnancy trying to convince us to change our minds about the name. When our baby was born and we named him what we wanted, my in-laws were furious that we had broken a seven-generation old family tradition. Some of them hadn't previously wanted to name their sons Peter, but did it anyway for the family's sake. They said our decision was selfish, and that my family should have moved on by now. This has truly nothing to do with whether my family has moved on or not, it just felt like a betrayal to my grandmother and uncle's memories to even consider using the name. My father-in-law offered us $1,000 to change our son's name to Peter after he was born. That was two months ago, and neither of my fiancé's parents have met the baby or seen us since I was pregnant. Most of my in-laws are on their side, and this is causing a huge rift between my fiancé and his family. He assures me he's fine, but I'm starting to feel really guilty about this. The tradition started, as far as I know, when OG Peter died and his son, also named Peter, named his firstborn after his father. Peter III ended up having the first son of the following generation, and did the same thing. That one died before having children, so his sister gave the name to her son, and so on. The name Peter is very common in my country, so none of them ever got bullied over it, and the fact that it was also my uncle's name isn't as unlikely as one might think. Also, middle names aren't used in my country, most people get the maternal surname before the paternal one instead. About a week after my post, my fiancé's parents contacted us. They apologized for their behavior, and begged to meet my son. They said they were ready to leave the naming debacle behind and truly wanted to be involved in their grandson's life. We were skeptical, but invited them over to meet the baby. The visit went well. They began coming over almost every day during the next three weeks. I noticed neither of them ever called my son by his name, but I didn't point it out. For the first time in months, things seemed good between my fiancé and his parents. One day, my fiancé was helping my father-in-law with something at our place, so my mother-in-law and I went to the park with my baby. Some time later, I had to go to the bathroom, so I left him in the stroller with her. When I got back, she was sitting on a park bench, chatting with a woman who was cooing over my son. I went over there and introduced myself as, son's name s mom and she said, I thought his name was Peter. I didn't say a word, and neither did my mother-in-law. She followed me to the car and we went back to my apartment. On the way there, I texted my fiancé about what had happened. The moment we got there, he kicked both his parents out of our place. He'd read my texts and confronted his father. Thankfully, my father-in-law is a terrible liar, and confessed immediately. Apparently, both my in-laws only call my son Peter. That includes whenever they're talking about him, every time they introduce him to someone else, and even baby talking to him on the few occasions they were left alone with him. Neither of them are embarrassed by this, and they both think they're in the right. We're heartbroken, especially my fiancé, not only because his parents can't let go of their pride, but also because the name we chose for our son means a lot to us both. I blame myself for encouraging my fiancé to allow them near our son. I was raised in a different city than all my grandparents, and always wished they could have been more involved in my life. Losing my grandmother didn't help. Pretty much every doubt I had only existed because I thought it would be important for my son to grow up with all of his grandparents around. But now, all my guilt is gone. If they can't respect my son enough to call him by his name, they don't deserve to be in his life. I hope they enjoyed the three weeks they had with their grandson. Because that's all they're getting until they get their heads out of their butts. My husband destroyed my car and refused to let me leave. All of this started because I accidentally deleted his meal when ordering food on an app yesterday morning. All of our three kids, and us, are very sick with croup and ear infections. My husband woke up in a rage from being sick, hung over and not having smoked because I told him he has to stop smoking in front of the kids. He wanted caffeine and food so he could function. He put his order on the app and I then did my order and placed it for priority delivery. Unfortunately when I was deleting a meal that I decided I did not want I deleted his meal off of the app. I didn't realize this had happened until the order had already been placed with priority delivery. I worked up the courage to go and tell him. I said I am so sorry please don't hate me but I accidentally removed your meal. I can go get in the car and drive to get you the food that didn't get on the order. He starts getting in a rage about the situation. He takes a look at the app and says why is this so effing expensive? You are making us lose money. Again I say I can go get you the order from the actual store, I have some cash in my wallet. He responds oh you have cash in your wallet? And laughs at me. He is getting more and more in a rage saying that all he effing needed was some caffeine and a stupid effing broccoli cheddar bread bowl to make him able to function. I have recently asked him to stop smoking and drinking in the morning so he can be more present so I'm sure this is partially my fault but also I recognize that this is his addiction and not mine to solve. I have tried everything. I noticed his signs of aggression setting in so I took the kids to another room. They're all screaming and crying clinging to me and he rips the baby gate off of the master bedroom door and throws it across the hallway. The master door is already ripped off halfway from him slamming it so many times. I'm in the room with the kids and I decide that croup and all we are not going to stay here with him acting like this. I pack three bags with the kids clothes and mine and plenty of diapers since all three are still in diapers. The order arrives bell rings he doesn't answer. Rings again. 
He says goddamn IT opens the door, says thanks, slams the door and throws the food on the table spilling the drinks. He comes in and says where are you going, you aren't leaving with my kids. Then he sees I'm packing the bags and says oh you're packing day bags, no effing way, and goes to rip them out of my arms. He twists my wrist while pulling then gives up and drops the bag, and he grabs his keys, rips the car seats out of my Tahoe and throws them in the garage, parks his long bed truck in front of my Tahoe so I can't leave. When he left the house to do this I grabbed my phone and pressed record on voice memo because this is the 100th argument like this over his rage and he always says the worst shit to me about how he will ruin me and take the kids from me. I tell him if he does not move his truck I am calling the police and I have a right to leave. I dial 911 and say go move your truck and go put those car seats back in my car right now or I am calling the police. I have a right to leave with my children. He refused and said I am not going anywhere and we can sit here and work this out like adults. I tell him I am done, I want a divorce and I cannot live like this anymore. He said that if I divorce him he is going to take everything from me, I will have nobody, I will have nowhere to go, I will have no kids and I'll never see them again. He claimed to me good luck getting child support because he makes $250,000 but only claims $70,000 on his taxes. He said he has evidence against me to take my kids from me and I'll never see them again. He said he is allowed to smoke because it's decriminalized. He couldn't remember the last time he had been sober from alcohol just one effing day when I inquired about it when stating that I want a divorce I've tried everything. I've shed every single piece of myself to make him happy instead of angry and help him be sober and it's never worked. I said I do not want you. I used to want you, I used to think I could do it but I can't. I said I want an amicable divorce and he can have the kids as much as he wants. He has to be sober when he has them and if he isn't I'll document it. He said that is not how this is going to play out. I said well I don't know what to do but I'm done I cannot live in fear and anxiety any longer. He looked at me, said the typical well this is a huge wake up call, I'm gonna throw away all the stuff, I'll move the beers to the fridge and I'll get sober. I don't remember what I said but I just stopped there and went back to my care tasks. I said I have to feed the baby, she needs a nap please leave me alone. I shut the kid's door and got her down for a nap and I didn't see him around. I think he was in the driveway putting the car seats back, but left his truck there. He took a hot bath and read a book called Man in the Mirror, a Christian men's book I guess. He said it's helping him already. He got on the phone with his sober friend while rolling a smoke for a rainy day he tried to give all the stuff to the other dad across the street who smokes but he didn't want it because he's trying to quit. He left the house to go buy paintbrushes and came back intoxicated or high after two hours gone. He started love bombing me, hugging me, touching me, kissing me and wouldn't leave me alone. I wanted to throw up from anxiety. He forced me to put the ring back on my finger. He drank beer and smoked before bed. I just want someone in my life to love me enough to be sober and kind. To love my kids enough to be sober. I don't want to ruin him, I don't want to destroy him. I just want some peace in my life because I deserve that. I am a mom who does everything. If I don't it won't get done. We have an autistic 4 year old, 2.5 year old and a 1 year old. Today is her birthday. I don't know what to do at this point. I'm broken. I have no job, $200 to my name, tons of bills and no degree. My parents aren't in my life because he made me think they were the problem and I shouldn't be close with them. We have a beautiful, modest home in the best neighborhood within walking distance to the elementary school. I live on a cul-de-sac with five of the best neighbors I've ever had. I've invested so much time into this life with him that I'm thinking I can just stick around and hope for the best but maybe I'm just stressed and emotionally drained. Please help me because I don't know where to turn. What is the most terrifying experience you've ever had? I was at a friend's house, safe in warm sheltered suburbia. We were having a lot to drink, chit-chatting, and enjoying ourselves. Of course, when you're having fun, time hits the fast forward button, and those few minutes turn into an hour. I had too much to drink. My friend has a bit of an abrupt bedtime, so I had to dodge out early, still intoxicated. I felt too shameful thinking I'd be asking too much to stay in his house to sleep off the drunkenness. I suppose he was either too rude or too drunk to consider it himself. Whatever. Sometimes a little inconvenience makes you appreciate everything else. I needed about another hour or so to sober up and drive back. As fast as time passed during my stay, it decided to drastically slow down as soon as I stepped out of his house. It was a cul-de-sac area, a concrete jungle with the stem of the street breaking into a fork. Alongside the road, my car was parked, the only street light that worked was in the middle of the cul-de-sac circle, about 80 yards away. I stumbled towards my car, produced my keys, felt the metal line up, opened my door, and shifted to the back seat. Because this was a dark, strange, and unfamiliar neighborhood, I took the leftover newspapers and a sweater in my back seat to cover myself up. I was a little scared, I wanted to camouflage myself and not just be some guy awkwardly sitting in his car waiting for time to pass in order to drive home. I couldn't fall asleep. The uncomfortable feeling of a cheap backseat bed enshrouded in darkness didn't make the chance of slumber easier, it felt too ominous. And of course, my mind began to wonder. I thought of worst case scenarios, like how the police would shine their lights on me through the window, or a drunk driver hit my car, and. In the distance, about 100 yards away, I could hear footsteps approaching. The gravel scuffed with each step forward, growing in proximity, but periodically taking stops. I wondered why until it made sense in my mind, whoever it was was probably looking through cars carefully, with the intent to steal one. I couldn't recall how many cars were on the block, but I counted three full stops until he was at my window, breathing. I froze. 
There was no more than one foot between us. The car encapsulated me as I lay hidden beneath backseat clutter, forming myself into an object, trying my hardest to be unnoticeable, unmoving and simply not there. I see you. Said a 40 plus year old man in baby talk. Imagine when you were playing hide and seek, and one of your friends tricks you into coming out. He said it in that tone of voice, as if baiting me like he was questioning whether the clutter in the backseat was just clutter. Or a person. I didn't want to move or check the window. I remained clutter. My body reacted by minimizing my breathing so much that I felt paralyzed. I dare not look. My eyes fixated on the back of the passenger seat. I didn't blink, I didn't move, I didn't breathe, my heart was pounding so hard it shook my body with each throb. He circled around the car, my ears didn't fail me. I heard the steps. I felt like I was part of the car, I could feel him touching the trunk as he carefully pressed down on it, as if to test the alarm, as if to test me. I was in the middle of fight or flight. I couldn't do either without elevating danger. I was frozen and hoping to God he was bluffing. He circled the car again. The door handle to my right jiggled. He was pulling it multiple times. I see you. Same tone, but more agitated and stressed, more convinced that he was trying to make that clutter move, revealing itself to be of his expectations that it was me. My muscles tensed like a cow before slaughter. Tap tap tap. That had to be metal against glass. A crowbar? A knife? A rock? A gun? My eyes fixated on the seat in front of me, never averting my gaze, like he was. I was covered enough to where I couldn't see beyond the seat in front of me. I know I couldn't see him, but I could feel his eyes resting on top of me. My name is Poker Face. What's your name? The voice changed, to a more demented and serious tone. My mind forced a visual, it wasn't anything human. I already accepted my death. I was ready to be shot in the head, ready to take a life-changing bullet, multiple knife wounds. Just make this sleep bearable, not excruciating, as you drain me of life. I wouldn't know how to react, my thoughts grew dimmer. I imagined my friend waking up the next morning after a calm night of safe and sound sleep only to discover my mutilated, defiled, and bloody body hanging outside my car door. It was then I heard nothing but my own heart. What was this person doing now? Just staring at me in the middle of the night? Talking to me, or a messy pile in the back seat? Time froze. The footsteps were being swallowed in the distance. Thank God he left. I waited another hour until the sun showed hints of itself. I jumped in my front seat and bolted out of there, wide-eyed and sober. Backpackers, what's your most terrifying experience deep in the woods? A couple of summers ago, my girlfriend and were I camping in Czech Magon National Forest in northern Wisconsin. And after our last experience, we do not plan to return. My girlfriend and I are from Chicago, so northern Wisconsin was our go-to place to get away. We've done a number of hiking trips in northern Wisconsin, but never to this area. We are not backpacking experts, but we have been to a number of national parks and have been out hiking and exploring when we can find time away from work. We love getting away from people and relaxing in nature. Our plan was to hike a remote section of the North Country Trail. The North Country Trail is a national scenic trail, like the Appalachian Trail, but it gets much less use. In some parts of northern Wisconsin, the trail is very remote, and the only access is via logging roads. We plan to hike 15 miles along the trail to a backpack shelter, spend the night, and hike back to the car the following day. We spent the night at a friend's house in Wausau, and we set out early the next day to the trailhead. As we entered the National Forest boundary, we were captivated by the beauty of the thick green forests. I drove slowly along the gravel logging roads as we made our way to our parking spot. While we were driving to the trailhead, we passed a couple of people standing next to a parked truck on the side of the road. They appeared to be hillbillies, as they had a rusted out, bunged up pickup truck, complete with Confederate bumper stickers. As we drove past, I waved, and they stared back without returning the greeting. Friendly people, I thought to myself. After we passed them, I looked in the rearview mirror and noticed they were still staring at us. And before we rounded a bend, I glanced back into the mirror again and saw them watching us through the haze of road dust. My girlfriend and I joked about the up north people, but we did not think anything of the encounter. Aside from those people, we did not encounter anyone else on the remote logging roads within the National Forest boundary. We found the trailhead about 15 minutes later, after winding our way on the narrow logging road. There was no one else parked at the trailhead, a perfect chance to get some needed solitude, fresh air, and relaxation. After parking and making sure the car was locked, we hoisted our packs and set off on the trail. The weather was relatively cool, which thankfully kept the mosquitoes and biting flies at bay. We took pictures along the way, and we marveled at the lushness of the forest and the topography of the glacial moraine. After a solid eight hours of hiking, we found our campsite. It consisted of a wooden backpack shelter and a fire ring. Even though the shelter provided ample space for us, we opted to set up our tent in a small clearing about 100 feet behind the shelter. We built a fire at the shelter fire ring, and I boiled water for our dehydrated trail food. As we ate, we watched the sky slowly turn dark. My girlfriend and I passed around a water bottle filled with wine, and we marveled at how many stars you could see away from the city. When the fire was reduced to a small pile of glowing embers, we decided to head back to the tent. We settled into our tent and looked through the pictures we took that day. But after lugging a heavy pack for 15 miles and drinking some wine, I was ready for some shut-eye. When we camped at state and national parks, I usually wore earplugs. 
But that night, there were no RVs or other campers to make noise, so I closed my eyes and let the noise of the forest lull me to sleep. My girlfriend was very uneasy that night, but she normally had some apprehension whenever we were sleeping away from home. I'm not sure when we drifted to sleep, but we awoke to a bone-chilling noise. It was pitch dark outside, and over the insects in the forest, I heard a dull thud. It sounded like someone was hitting two logs together. My girlfriend and I were wide awake at this point, and we lay silently in our tent hearing the noise again. Our old tent had mesh windows, but the backpacking tent we were using had no windows. We could only guess what was making the noise outside our tent. We initially thought that an animal got at our food in a garbage bag, which we left in the shelter, but the noise was too distinct, and it did not sound like rustling through food wrappers or our camp equipment. Our hearts were pounding as we heard the persistent knock in the darkness. Unarmed and terrified, we did not know what to do. I would normally have carried a can of bear spray, but I decided to leave it at home to save on weight, against the wishes of my girlfriend. The knocking continued but we remained still so as to not give away our location. For all we knew, whatever was making the noise had already spotted our tent. After what seemed like an eternity, the knocking sound ceased. We lay in complete silence with only the dull buzz of the insects in the background. Then we heard it. Leaves rustling, a branch breaking. Voices. We heard low talking in the distance. We could not make out what was being said but it sounded like a couple of people taking in the distance. The voices continued for a bit, but to our relief, the voices did not seem to be getting louder. Whoever was out there did not spot the tent or decided to leave us alone. We sat in our tent for the rest of the night, adrenaline surging through our veins. At the first light, we slowly got out of the tent. I looked around in all directions to see if anyone was out there, but I only saw the forest and the backpack shelter. We quickly rolled up our sleeping bags and camp pads and put our tent away. When we got to the shelter my girlfriend screamed in horror. At the entrance to the shelter, the wood was freshly cut. The word kill was cut into the shelter wall, and there were a number of axe or knife cuts where someone was chopping at the wall. I looked at the ground and saw a scattering of fresh wood splinters. After grabbing our food supply and garbage bag, we got the heck out of there. We were nearly jogging with our gear as we made our way back to the car. I kept glancing back over my shoulder, and gazing out through the woods to see if anyone was following us. We traversed the glacial eskers that we saw the day before, and we knew we were getting close to our car. We were quietly rejoicing as we neared the trailhead. We made it back to the trailhead in near record time. But something was wrong. The windshield wiper on my car was sticking straight up and there was something stuck to the wiper. As we inched closer to the car, I saw there was blood smeared on the windshield and a squirrel carcass was impaled on the wiper blade. Hair and blood were still stuck to the wiper and on the hood of the car. I didn't bother cleaning off the car. We threw our gear in the trunk and I sped off without removing the animal from the wiper blade. As I sped down the gravel logging road, I kept glancing in the rearview mirror, but I could not see anything through the cloud of road dust behind the car. When we got to a gas station in the nearest town, I removed the carcass with a wad of newspaper, and I tried to remove as much dry blood as I could. I filled up on gas and we didn't stop until we made it to Milwaukee. This was the last trip I took to the woods of northern Wisconsin. What is the most touching act of kindness you have ever received? One day in 1983, my husband and I returned home after sleeping overnight at my mother's house. The house, a little four-room cottage filled with hand-me-downs and wedding gifts, was our first home together. There were several feet of snow against the side of the buildings characteristic for mid-New England winter. As we pulled into the drive, I saw a wisp of snow on the roof. It looked funny. It was gray. I suddenly realized what it was. Smoke. Smoke. And then, the fire was over. People left. I was standing looking at the fragments of our life and home all over the top of the driveway, just as black and broken and trampled as I felt. I felt the hot tears finally start running down my cheeks as the enormity of the task ahead hit me. We had nothing left at all. I had lost my textbooks. All our wedding gifts, our pictures, the precious little things you keep as mementos. I had my cat, my husband, and that was about it. My husband was with his parents in a neighbor's living room talking to the fire inspector who was explaining what had happened, the fire department had found faulty wiring as the cause. My father-in-law was a firefighter in a neighboring community so he wanted to know every detail. My parents were there too, horrified to hear that if had we been home, we would have died as the fire started under the doorway to our bedroom. So, there I stood, actually and emotionally alone, and oh, I felt it. And, as I stood there standing looking at what had been my life, a firefighter came past with a hose reel. I looked at him, and whispered thank you. I will never forget him. His face was covered with soot-coated ice. His face was black with soot, his red-rimmed eyes were fatigued. He was there on the first engine that arrived, he had been there for the whole fire. He said come here and put his big arms around me. I burst into tears in the arms of this big wet dirty stranger, and he held me as I did. For the first time, I felt safe, I just knew for the moment in his arms nothing else bad could happen. I relaxed a bit, and when I did, the emotion poured out and I cried every tear I had so bravely held back during the preceding hours. And then, he lifted my chin, looked at me, and said words that helped that moment and in all those which would follow. This is the worst part. But, from here, it gets better. Look forward to it getting easier, don't hold on to today, live for tomorrow, let people help, they will. But, the loss is past. Let it pass. There is something better coming. He walked me over to the Red Cross van, 
he spoke to someone there and left some information. The Red Cross lady made sure we had a place to stay, we had appointments for help, and she handed me a crumpled paper. She smiled, and I knew what was on the paper. He'd left his name. And, he helped set up the fundraiser that buoyed us, held at the firefighters' social club. He delivered boxes of stuff he didn't need and stuff some people had. He called and asked how it was going. He helped deliver the donated sofa to the apartment one of his friends had and was willing to let us into without any money up front. I couldn't prove it, but I was sure he was behind at least a few of the envelopes with $40 to $50 that arrived in the door without a name. He didn't know us, but he became a friend. And one day I asked him why. He said, when I saw you there, I could feel how alone you felt, and I couldn't let you think that was all there was. I wanted you to have hope. And that gift of hope, that kindness from one stranger to another, got me through one of the most difficult days of my life. He died years ago, and I attended his wake, an open casket visiting hours affair. There was an honor guard from the fire department. He had been there for so many, and you know what? His wife never knew. He never told her. He never told his kids, three daughters my age who looked on numbly at the body in the casket. His kindness to me, and to so many, will never be forgotten. What is the best example of something that seemed like a curse in the moment, but actually turned out to be a blessing? I work as a police and fire dispatcher. This in itself is stressful. In 2017, we were in the middle of a very busy evening with a major accident when I looked in our computer-aided dispatch and saw the registration information. I realized it was the car my mom had just bought my 17-year-old daughter. But wait, it gets worse. The accident was so bad that they were asking for multiple engines and rescues. Then I noticed the traffic units were being dispatched, which only happens with great bodily harm or death. But I couldn't leave, even though by now I had confirmed it was my family on scene. I had to get them help before I left work, the field units were barking out orders and demanding resource after resource. It took everything I had to sit there and get them what was needed. But wait, it gets worse. I was finally told I had to respond to the scene. My 68-year-old, mentally disabled adopted sister was injured, hysterical, and they were unable to calm her down. And because my 17-year-old daughter was injured and refusing to be treated, she only wanted to leave and wait at the hospital to hear about her grandma who the rescue units had scooped and ran with. This means the paramedic felt she had a very slim chance of survival and she might make it out alive if she gets to the hospital quickly. My mom broke both legs, both arms, all the fingers in her right hand, her pelvis, her hip, and her back. She was in a medically induced coma. She miraculously survived but was bedridden for the rest of her life, she needed help with everything. She was still lucid. She just never walked again. Throughout the year, she contracted sepsis multiple times. She would refuse to go to the doctor or stay in a rehab facility. She would only go when she was unconscious or not lucid enough to say no. But wait, it gets worse. Back in 2016, I noticed a lump in my abdomen. I went to the doctor over and over again and their diagnoses ranged from a cyst to an infection for which I was prescribed antibiotics. It wouldn't stop growing, and by 2018 it was the size of a cantaloupe. It ruptured at work, and the bleeding was so bad I was soaked in blood from the waist down. Finally, my doctor decided to remove it. They left a huge gaping hole which had to be packed. It kept getting infected, no matter how many times I would clean it and how thorough I was. I was told it was nothing to worry about. After a third massive infection, I scheduled an appointment and saw a nurse practitioner because the doctor wasn't available. It was at this appointment that I was asked, why aren't you getting treatment for your cancer? I was told the mass was the cyst, but when it was tested further they found lymphoma. By the time I got to an oncologist, I had stage 4 cancer and 27 tumors. But wait, it gets worse. I had to move back in with my mom before all of this happened to pull our resources together to make ends meet. We had an agreement on rent. My mom had always been bad with money. Don't get me wrong, she was a great mom, she just loved to buy junk online. While I was hospitalized, I found out our house was in foreclosure. The mortgage company would not work with us. They wanted 30k. I had to scramble to find us housing that was handicapped accessible while being hospitalized. My mom got sepsis again. She was transported to the same hospital where I was admitted. This time she was so bad, doctors recommended hospice. In this hospital, hospice was on the same floor as cancer patients. My mom died 400 feet from me, but I was not allowed in her room and I was not allowed to say goodbye. But wait it gets worse. I had a daughter I had to support so I worked right through chemo. I was in an incredible amount of pain and I was very sick. I was very cranky and my brain was fried from chemo. The quality assurance specialist was nitpicking everything we as a department did. I was accused of saying someone should shut her up, so she filed a complaint against me. They opened a whole investigation for the inappropriate comment I supposedly made but they refused to pull the video to show me where I said it. I was told since I didn't remember, I must have said it, I was too tired, too sick, and too weak to fight it. But wait it gets worse. I had to stop working for 6 months. I ran out of sick leave and my employer would not pay their portion of the premiums unless I had sick leave. Their part of my health insurance was over $1,000 a month. The first round of chemo failed. The second round of chemo failed. I had to move 500 miles from home for treatment. I had to live in a hotel room alone. I was so sick after my treatments I couldn't walk more than a few steps. I had to crawl to the bathroom and just ended up sleeping on the bathroom floor in the hotel room because I didn't have the energy to crawl back to my bed. I was supposed to be on anti-seizure meds but I couldn't hold them down. I ended up having a seizure and was found unconscious, barely breathing by the hotel staff. 
I was in a coma for nine days. When I came out, I couldn't walk at all and had to use a wheelchair. I ended up with cytokine release syndrome and was straight up crazy for a few weeks. I really was very lucky. And cancer was a blessing. Before, I was severely overweight, but thanks to my cancer and the treatments I lost hundreds of pounds and I've kept it off. I feel like I have a new lease on life. Older siblings, what's the sweetest thing you did for a younger sibling that they'll never know about? So my family usually opens presents on Christmas morning around 8 a.m., but due to my mother working this year, we had to start at 6.30. Now, my brother and I are of age and old enough to understand the Santa process. However, we have a younger sister, Katie, who still fully believes. She did the list, put out the cookies, and so on. The main thing she wanted this Christmas and last year was a Nintendo Switch. I don't know much about it other than it's expensive and could make a child's Christmas wish come true. So it comes midnight, and my mother and I are wrapping up the presents for everyone while they're asleep. We're checking off the list to make sure nothing was forgotten. But then we come across the Nintendo on the list. My mom asks me where it is, and I have no clue. I go up and ask my dad, and he has no clue. Everyone in my family, no clue. We all begin scrounging the house, top to bottom. Every corner, every drawer, every hiding spot. Even the vents? Time passes, we're still looking, it's two in the morning. We should have been asleep an hour ago. My mother has to wake up in four hours to get ready for a full day of work and be with us for presents. She's crying, my dad's pissed, and I'm nervous. I send my parents up to bed and tell them to leave it up to me. Still don't know why I said this. But I stay up, still looking. It's now 4 a.m. I'm ready to pass out. I decide to write the letter from Santa myself, stating the following. Dear Katie, I hit a major storm in the middle of the night and lost Dasher and 60% of my presents. Expect a delivery from the elves within the next few days. So I'm looking up what stores I can buy this Nintendo Switch again. Of course, they're all closed at 4 a.m., but they're closed all day for Christmas too. Now I'm bugging. I decide to let the note do its magic and pray I can find a Nintendo Switch to buy again. Christmas morning comes along and she reads the note. She starts freaking out that Santa even made it in such a bad storm. But she's also freaking out that Dasher is on the loose. I try to calm her down. She keeps screaming and panicking that Santa can't fly without all his reindeer and is probably missing. Finally, we open the rest of the presents. We left the Switch game wrapped, and she opened it. Gave it away instantly. Now I'm frustrated that we were so unprepared. This is supposed to be a huge gift. We finish up presents and my mom goes to work. At this point my sister is playing with her stuff, and I'm checking out my new bling. Then I remember that my polish for jewelry was in the trunk of the car. I open up the trunk, and there it is. The Nintendo Switch. Sitting right there. Staring at me. I start crying tears of joy. I don't have to spend another 300 on a console and games. I wrap it instantly and leave it on the front bench. I go upstairs, play the sound of a hoofing horse from my speaker, and make a loud bang. When I sneak back downstairs my sister asks, what was that? I tell her, I don't know, it sounded like it came from outside. Want me to check? Sis. It's Dasher. IT has to be. He has it. She runs as fast as I've ever seen her run down the stairs and whips the door open. Finally, she falls upon the gift wrapped up on the bench. She grabs it and runs inside. When she opens it, she cries. Santa really does listen. And then I cried. Again. Because I was so relieved it was over. All in all, she was happy and I was happy. My parents were pissed they left it somewhere so stupid, but in the end Christmas was even more fun for my sister. My mother-in-law shows her true racist colors. My husband and I have been together for four years and we just got married in October of 2022. He's amazing, quite literally the man of my dreams and I have an amazing life with him now. My parents and the rest of my family love him. I'm Native American and have a really big family and he comes to family events, holidays, cookouts, etc. And I haven't heard a single member of my family say they didn't like him. My husband's family is very small. Other than his parents, he has one brother, his wife and their two kids. His brother and his family live multiple states away, so we only see them around the holidays and they don't really have much extended family. So the only members of my husband's family I really see are his parents. His parents are the stereotypical white conservative small town Christians. My husband is no longer religious. Mother-in-law, M.I.L., stays at home and tends to the house while father-in-law, F.I.L., works. I was worried about his parents' beliefs at first as I practice my native tribe's spiritual beliefs. I'm very left-leaning socially and politically, don't dress very conventional, and my husband and I have no desire to have children. But they were pretty chill with me when I met them the first time. His dad I've had no problems with, but over time, I have begun having trouble with his mother. She just flat out doesn't like me. According to my Phil she has said I'm not the kind of woman that needs to be with her son. Her reasoning is because I don't act like a woman, I won't be a housewife, and I have a man's job. I'm a flight paramedic for a service that airlifts critically unstable patients. I love my job and I love being a paramedic. My husband has never expressed that he wants me to be a housewife or take up a stereotypically feminine job. 
If he did we wouldn't be together, but apparently that's what his mother thinks he needs. When I first met his parents we had been dating for about 5 months. Mill said at first that I didn't look like the kind of woman my husband would bring home. I didn't take it to heart, I figured she didn't mean it in a harsh way. When they asked what I did for work I told them I was a flight medic. Phil said that was awesome while Mill just kinda frowned and didn't say anything. Whatever, she was pretty cordial in the beginning, but as my husband and I got more and more serious, she began to not like me more. It started out with snide comments. She would manage to sneak into conversations the fact that she thinks women should be homemakers, or have jobs like teacher or caretaker. When started working 48 hour shifts, she asked who was going to take care of the housework. My husband told her he would while I was gone those two days. She got upset and said it wasn't fair that I made her son do it all by himself while I left. My husband told her that we split household chores evenly and that it was fine. One day we were over and she went off on this rant about how she missed when women acted like women and men acted like men. She started talking about how women needed to start being housewives and mothers again while the men worked and provided. While she never directly said it, I knew she included me in that. Phil told her to calm down and that this wasn't the time for that kind of discussion and she got mad and said well it's just the truth and looked in my direction. I'm not an idiot, I knew this rant was just a way for her to tell me how she felt without directly telling me. My husband was pretty angry when we left and I can't say I was too pleased. I told him she was allowed to have her opinion no matter how stupid it was and I wasn't going to lose sleep over the fact that she seems to still be living in the 1950s. He said he was angry about the blatant disrespect. He talked to her about it and said she wouldn't do it again. So I managed to let that situation roll off my shoulders. Everything came to a head with her a few weeks ago. Phil invited us over for dinner so we went. My cousin is getting married in a few months and my husband mentioned that we were going to the wedding. It will be a traditional wedding in accordance with our tribe's customs. Phil said that was cool and Mill asked if there was going to be alcohol there. I didn't really see how that was an issue so I said yes. She responded with son, you don't need to be around all that drinking. My husband said it was fine and that it wouldn't be a problem. She said no you don't need to go, it's not safe if there's going to be alcohol there. I said why wouldn't it be safe? It's not like we're going to be at a bar, it's just gonna be my family. She then said well some people can get violent when they drink. I knew exactly what some people meant and that this was a racist remark. I told her that no one would be getting violent and that everyone would have a designated driver. My husband then said that we were going and there wasn't going to be any negotiation about it because he was a grown man and could make decisions for himself. That just made her more upset and she started going off about how it wasn't a good idea for him to be around a bunch of drunk people. After Phil told her to calm down, my husband asked why it mattered so much to her anyway because it's not like we were forcing her to go with us. She then said I just don't think it's a good idea for you to be around a bunch of drunk Indians. I was in shock. I knew this is what she meant but I didn't think she had the balls to flat out say it. You can't be serious, I said. She proceeded to tell me, I am serious. I know how you people are and I don't want my son around it. My husband began to lose it and started yelling at her. I honestly didn't have a response to that, I was just dumbfounded, as was my Phil. My husband told her he would not stand for her blatant disrespect and hatefulness any longer and was not going to allow her to be racist towards me. She then said I can't believe you're seriously choosing this red-skinned bitch over your own mother. I gave birth to you. I told her to go duck herself and left out the front door, with my husband following me. She came running out the door after him begging him not to leave. He then told her no, F you, you're dead to me and I never want to hear from or see you again. He was shaking with anger when he got in the car and told me he was done with her and her crap and that we wouldn't be going back over there. Ever since then she has been blowing up our phone saying she's sorry and begging to reconcile. I don't know what to do. My husband is angry and upset that his mother is like this. Does anyone have any advice on how to deal with a situation like this? Those falsely convicted of a crime, how'd you end up? It was a hot July afternoon a few years back. I was getting ready to jump in the shower to go work for a few hours when I heard a knock on the door. I had a pair of gym shorts on, so I went and answered it. To my amazement, there were a bunch of cops outside. They told me they had had a complaint of loud noise and possibly domestic violence. I just laughed and said, no, that's not here, I live alone. The officers remained serious. One of them asked me if I had any ID on me so they could go about their business, and I said, sure. My wallet was on the wall right by the door, so I pulled my ID out and handed it to one of the officers. He looked at it and asked me if I could step outside again. I kind of chuckled and said, yeah, no problem. As soon as I stepped out of the door of my house, the other officer commanded, turn around. Put your hands behind your back. I looked at him kind of funny, and I said, what for? Again, he told me to turn around. So I turned around, I put my hands behind my back. Suddenly, I felt handcuffs, and they ordered me to sit down in front of the house. I asked one of the other officers what this was all about. He said, there's a warrant out for my arrest. Now, mind you, I have never been in any kind of trouble at all in my life. And so again, I kind of chuckled. I said, what kind of warrant? The officer said he doesn't know because it's from out of state. Now I'm starting to get a little freaked out. So the officer leads me into the police car. All I have is my gym shorts and flip-flops and my cell phone. They stripped me of my phone immediately. About 45 minutes later, as we're driving to the holding cell, I asked the officer what this is all about. He said he really didn't know, but because the warrant is out of state, they have to take me to jail. He also said there's a no bond clause on this warrant, which means until I figure out what this is, I'm stuck there. I was put into a holding cell with about 15 gang members in Fort Lauderdale Broward County Jail. About 11 that night, I was transferred to a holding jail, 
given a two-inch mattress and a blanket, and was told to go to sleep on the floor. At this point, I've asked probably four or five officers what's going on, and nobody seems to know. I haven't seen an attorney, and I don't have any telephone numbers memorized. Stupid smartphones. So the next day, I ask an officer again, what's going on, and how do I find out? He comes back and simply says it's an out-of-state warrant, and I'll have to wait to see the judge. I said I want to access my cell phone so I can find some numbers and call somebody. Here's where it gets really bad. I don't see a judge for eight days. I have to spend eight days in jail not having any idea why, not seeing an attorney and having no access to call anyone. I finally see a judge on the eighth day and he tells me it's an out-of-state warrant and again he doesn't know what it's for and I have a choice, I can fight extradition or I can concede to extradition. If I fight I'm going to probably be there for 60 days minimum and possibly be let out. If I concede I could be there another 45 days before they take me to the other state. So I conceded and I asked him for the court order to access my phone. The judge says he's never heard of having to have a court order to access a cell phone but reluctantly gives one. On the ninth day, when I ask to access my phone again, I'm told that they're not going to allow me to access my phone even though they have a court order because the phone battery is dead. Now I don't know what to do. This is the ninth day and it turns into the 10th and 11th and 12th, and so on. On the 23rd day, no one in the world knows where I am. I'm assuming my kids probably think I'm dead, as they live in another state. North Carolina shows up to extradite me on the 23rd day. During this 48-hour trip where I'm shackled hand and foot in the back of a van, I finally convinced one of the officers that is driving to access their Facebook account and message a close friend of mine to try to get in touch. They do that and of course my friend thinks it's a scam. Finally I gave him information that only I would know and he sent his phone number. On the 25th day in North Carolina I finally found out what the charge is. A former client of mine from 4 years prior in a business that I had had and signed over to another partner had accused me of taking $20,000 and fleeing the state. I laughed again. But not real hard this time because this was getting real. As I'm booked into their jail I'm trying to figure out what to do. The next day I finally saw an attorney. He doesn't have too much information for me but tells me what the charge entails and what the possibilities are for sentencing and things like that. A few days later he comes back with the evidence brought against me. As we went through it, I found nothing at all pointing to any kind of criminal activity for me, which of course I knew because I hadn't done anything. However, I did find a receipt from an unknown company that was in my former partner's handwriting and had his home address as the address for the unknown company. The amount receipted was $12,000. I told my attorney what I found and then was escorted back to my cell. Days and weeks go by. No news at all. The total amount of time I spent in this jail was 52 days. They demanded $25,000 in cash in order to release me or I was just stuck there. I had access to no money at all however I had finally called my buddy who had gotten in touch with my sister and they had let my kids know what was going on. On about the 40th day I woke up with some pain. Looks like I had caught an infection and it was in my right testicle. I had no way to contact a nurse except to put it on a message board requesting medical. There was no medical that day, there was no medical the next day, even though I requested it again. A week later I finally saw a nurse, and told them the infection had spread to my ear. She gave me one antibiotic pill that day and told me I would get another the next day. On the 51st day I saw my attorney and my attorney had told me at this point the DA is not going to offer a plea bargain because the evidence against you doesn't make sense. However there is a possibility that there will be a plea bargain offer but it probably won't be for about 6 months. If at that point I plead not guilty it may be another 6 months to a year before there is a trial. At this point I just told my attorney that we need to speak to the DA. He says he doesn't have time to do that and I said no problem. Give me the name of the DA and the telephone number and I'll have my sister three-way with me and we'll call him ourselves. Something amazing happened at that point. The next morning my attorney arrived and told me I was getting out that day. The state released me on my signature with no money involved. So I left North Carolina on a Thursday evening and had to take a train back to South Florida. I got home Friday night. Fortunately through this time I've spoken to my landlord, even though I had been evicted because she didn't know where I was, she let me stay. My car had been repoed, the companies that I have done business with had cancelled contracts, and one had even charged me back almost $75,000. But at least I had a place to stay. So I begin to regroup the next afternoon and I notice that my eye is hurting. By that night I couldn't see from my right eye and it was in so much pain that I had to call an ambulance. Long story short, I ended up staying the night in the hospital with an infection that had gone into my eye behind my eye and was in the process of getting ready to attack my brain. I lost sight in my right eye that day. Ended up several months later having to have a cornea transplant. The transplant was a year and a half ago, and I still can't see very well out of the eye. Today is July 22nd, almost two years from the arrest and the case still hasn't been closed. I've been told over and over that they're going to dismiss the charges but they haven't done that as of yet. People who served in the Air Force, what's the scariest thing you've witnessed? I was a munition systems technician, and I worked in a very large storage facility in Europe. This place had dozens of buildings, including many earth-covered magazines housing thousands of bombs. This bomb dump was completely forested, and populated with wildlife. Now, despite having a small deer population, this forest wasn't nice and clear. Most forests have a fire or two to clear them out every 20 years or so. This forest had played host to munitions storage since World War II, and had no fires since. It was thick, dark, and dank. The trees were so overgrown that you would be hard-pressed to see 10 yards in a straight line. It was a pretty creepy place in the daytime, and even more at night. Twice a day, we had to run a security check to make sure that no holes had been cut through the fence, and all of the buildings were closed and locked. The checks were run by the morning and afternoon crews unless of course they screwed up, 
which they did one afternoon. The one guy in control doesn't realize that no PM security check was run until about 1 AM. Since no one is working dispatch, he just walks down the hall to our office and asks us to run it. Me and my friend Brian volunteered to take a truck out and run the check. We grabbed a walkie talkie and a flashlight and headed out. Brian decides that a piss and a cigarette are in order before we begin the building check, which would take us another hour or so. He shuts the truck off, drops the tailgate and we just sit and chill in utter darkness while he burns down his sig. To this day, I don't know why he shut that ignition off. When we hopped back in and tried to start the truck again nothing happened. The ignition simply didn't fire. No attempted turnover. No sputter and fail. Just silence. It must have been an electrical problem. Oh man, we both thought and said simultaneously. Control, this is storage one. The truck broke down out here. Silence. Control, we're out past building 70. We need a ride. You copy? Silence. We tried the walkie-talkie for a good 15 minutes before we realized that we would be walking back. There were no streetlights, but at least we would know where we were going. We would have had to walk about a mile northward to the main corridor, and then turn east for another three miles. Not too bad. But for some reason we thought it would be much faster to take a shortcut through the forest. What a bright idea. I trudged out into the woods with Brian. You'd think that Brian had balls of steel. This was all his testosterone-laden idea anyway after all. Well, this wasn't so. About 10 minutes in, Brian was whimpering. Brian's anxiety was strong and I could sense it, and worse of all it was getting increasingly contagious. Neither of us had watches on, and our cell phones were back in our lockers. So we had no real idea what time it was. But we were too far into the woods to go back. It was probably only about 20 minutes since we had left the truck, but it might as well have been hours, when we reached the row of buildings. These were old buildings, above-ground brick structures, not the concrete igloos. The above-ground magazines had specially designed roofs that would blow upwards in the event of a catastrophic explosion, minimizing damage to nearby structures. They were also some of the oldest buildings in the bomb dump, little newer than World War II itself. They were ramshacked, rusted, and coated in moss. Inside they were dank and moldy. The only thing we kept in them were plain MK-82 bomb bodies. The least expensive, and least sensitive stock that we had. The only saving grace about these buildings was the dim industrial lights over their doorways. While not ideal, the soft orange glow was a welcome break from our flashlight. We started walking down the gravel road that these buildings lined. We passed one. Then another, and another. Oh my god. Joe. One of the buildings was open. The big steel blast doors were sealed, but the side door for personnel to use was propped open with a rock. A control. This is storage one. Um building 62 is not secure. Silence. Did you get that control? Building 62 is open. Silence. I looked at Brian. You know, we have to check this out right? Though it was too dark to tell, I'm pretty sure Brian went a little pale. Yep. We approached the door like Osama bin Laden was going to jump out with a scimitar and gut us. Hello? I felt a chill roll over me as I entered. Brian followed. It stunk in the building. It smelled like wet concrete and mildew. I shined the flashlight down a row of bombs. There were hundreds in there. When I was satisfied, we headed back to the doorway. We didn't have the keys to lock it up, but at least we could say that it was secure. That's when I heard it. The most blood-curdling scream I had ever heard. My heart dropped to my stomach. Brian just ran. I just followed him. We ran all the way out of the building, across the road, and into the trees. What the F, Brian was shaking. I'm pretty sure that I was too. I'm not sure how I got out of breath. We only ran about 20 yards from the building, but it felt like I had just ran a marathon. I hunkered down, resting my palms on my knees. What was that? It sounded like a banshee, man, Brian said. Then my heart sank. Oh Jesus. We left the door open. Just leave it. Dude. We can't. We already called it in. We'd be screwed. For the next 10 minutes, we just sat there panting, watching the door. Whatever was in there, it seemed to have no interest in following us out. Brian and I looked at each other, and knew that we had to go shut the door. We both began walking up to it slowly. I was careful not to shine the flashlight into the door. I didn't want to get the attention of whatever was in there. We paused about three feet from the door. We'll just shut it dude. And we did. I slid the rock away with my foot, and Brian gently closed the door. Not another noise came from building 62. Control. Building 62 is now closed, but it is still unlocked. Copy that? But the night wasn't over. You'd think we'd stick to the road after the run-in with the fucking hell banshee scream. But things don't always pan out the way you want. We started up the gravel road towards the central corridor, passing more of the old brick magazines. We had about half a mile to go now, when there was another scream. We froze. It came from right up the road, just ahead of us. It came again. It was the most horrid heart-rending sound I've ever witnessed in person. I shined my flashlight about, but there was nothing but pitch black, and dense foliage. Hey man, if we go this way, the missile shop is pretty close. Brian pointed off into the forest. He was right too. Missile shop was a small office attached to a work bay, where missiles were pulled from storage and inspected. Of course, no one would be there to let us in, but there was a patio and it was well lit with flood lamps. I weighed the options in my mind. Cut another quarter mile through the forest or we could keep walking towards the screen, and have another several miles of pitch black road until we got back to the main office. Yeah. Let's go, I said, feeling somewhat bold and scared at the same time. And once again, 
We were back trudging through the woods, the source of the screams getting further behind us. About five minutes into the brush, we realized this patch was much thicker than the first one. We were working our way through, starting to become quite anxious, when we came to a small opening, about shoulder width and clear of debris. It was a way through. Instinctively we began following it. The path widened more and more, until we were in a small clearing. I could now faintly see the floodlights through the heavy brush ahead. Look! There it is, I said pointing. Speaking was the wrong thing to do. At this very moment a set of eyes appeared about 20 feet in front of us. Big giant yellow eyes gleaming in my flashlight. I sensed more movement around us. I twitched the flashlight. Eyes. Everywhere. Big yellow eyes, gleaming in my flashlight. We were literally surrounded. I couldn't breathe. Brian made no sound. We watched utterly horrified. All of a sudden, a whole bunch of deer rose from their resting spots and passively trotted away. I gasped. Deer. It's just deer. We both began howling with laughter. Moments later we were through the brush, and Brian was smoking another cigarette on the missile shop patio. He looks at me and says, don't tell anyone, but I was terrified back there. I was too. Once we had laughed off the fact that we were huge pussies, we walked the rest of the way back to our office. The one dude in control was playing Halo with the others and his walkie-talkie was down the hall in his office.